Andrew Womack Ministries presents this message titled, Faith is Based on Knowledge. We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Let's look over in 2 Peter chapter 1. And this is going to be a continuation of some things we started talking about last night. If you missed last night, get a tape. But we started talking about the fact that God has already given us His faith. And the faith that you have is not your faith. Now, it belongs to you, but it is God's faith that's been committed unto you. You have the exact same faith inside of you that indwelt Paul, that indwelt Peter, that indwelt the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And that's the reason that Jesus said, The works that I do shall you do also, and greater works than these shall you do, because I go unto the Father. It's because he, it's no longer us that lives, but Christ lives in us. He gave us His power. We used Ephesians 1, 17, where he said that the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, that you may be able to see the hope of his calling. And it said, the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. So the same power that God the Father used to raise Jesus Christ from the dead is the same power that's been committed unto you. And man, when you begin to realize that you've got that kind of power and authority, I guarantee you something's going to give. No longer are you going to sit down and let the devil run over you and, and do all this. You know the reason people come up with so many doctrines about, well, it's God that put your sickness on you, that it's God that put trials and tribulations, it's God's will that you be sick, poor, that you be defeated, that you just learn how to roll with the punches. One of the basic motivations behind that kind of a doctrine is they're trying to justify their position of not having any power. Amen. Now, I don't mean that critical because I've been in that same situation and I did it, but I can promise you that after I've come out of it, that was one of the motivations behind it. I was trying to justify my situation so that I could live with it. Amen? Amen. So that I wouldn't feel condemned. And so it's easy to just say, well, it must not be God's will. But once you begin to understand that God has committed unto you the same power and the same authority that Jesus had, I guarantee you, it'll make you get rid of those kind of doctrines because you'll, you'll start saying, well, if I've got the same thing Jesus had, praise God, I can start believing for the same results. Amen. And we ought to get hungry for that, you know what? Amen. Did you know there's a lot of people that are just satisfied on a mediocre life? And I don't believe that that's y'all. Because if it was, you'd go join a mediocre church. Amen? Amen? You wouldn't be coming out. You wouldn't be driving from Cincinnati to go hear somebody if you were content with just going and putting in your one hour a week or something like that. You see, you've been stirred up to expect more. But did you know, even among spirit-filled people, a lot of spirit-filled people are stopping short today, and they're stopping at just receiving part of what God has for us. We ought to get hungry, brothers and sisters, for more than what we see today. What we've experienced is great, and in comparison from where we've come from, it's tremendous. But in comparison to where we're supposed to be, we're still a long way short. Amen. We need to get so hungry and thirsty for righteousness that we'll never be satisfied till the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Amen. I mean, that nothing, I don't care how many people you see healed or delivered, nothing's going to satisfy you until we reach the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ Jesus. We need to get stirred up on that. Anyway, that's what that'll do, is letting you see that you have the faith of God on the inside of you. If we've got the faith of God, we ought to be doing the works of God. And if I was to sit here and ask you today, how many of you believe, brother, we have the power and the anointing that Jesus had? Most of you, amen. But let me ask you this, how many of you doing the works that Jesus did? There wouldn't be near as many amens. Well, a person that says that they believe something and yet it's not believed enough that it's reproduced in their life, they don't believe it. Amen or oh me? Amen. I'm not saying that to condemn you. I'm saying it to just prick you to let you understand that, brothers and sisters, we need to keep pressing until we start seeing the life of Jesus reproduced in us because that's available to us. That's what we're supposed to be. That's what a Christian is. Christian is a derogatory term that they used in the first century. They called them, you little Christians, you little Jesus. In other words, they were acting so much like Jesus, they associated it with Jesus, thinking that was a derogatory term. Man, that's a, that's a blessing, amen. Somebody call you a little Jesus. If somebody arrested you for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict any of you? Amen. Well, we ought to have the evidence. People ought to be able to look at us and see the life of Jesus on the inside of us. Well, it's one thing that'll do that's when you go to realizing that you've got the faith of God. If we've got the faith of God, let's use it. So how do you use it? What I'm sharing with you tonight is, I believe, one of the most profound things God's ever shared with me. And I've known some of these things for a long period of time, but it's only been within, say, a year and a half or two years 
that I started bringing some of these things together and putting them in these exact words. And it's helped me and it's blessed me. I believe that most of you, as we talk about these things tonight, it'll be things that maybe you've heard before, but maybe you haven't heard it put in this context to see how important it is to your faith. And when you learn this, I promise you, if you will take the things we've talked about and put them to practice in your life, it will literally revolutionize your life. It'll take the struggle out of the Christian life. And that's one thing, boy, that God has impressed on me a thousand times over that the Christian life is not supposed to be a struggle. And I see so many people struggling. If you're struggling, something's wrong. Now, if you don't know what's wrong, keep struggling. Amen. Don't quit. But I'm saying don't be content with struggling. You need to realize, like Jesus said, that the life that I give you or the spirit that I give you will be in you a well of living water springing up unto everlasting life. That's a picture, brother, of an artesian well. I mean something that just bubbles up that you couldn't dam it up if you wanted to. And yet most Christians... A uh, well springing up isn't the best way to describe them. A lot of Christians, the best thing that describes them is one of these old pumps, you know, that you used to get and just pump and pump and pump. You'd have to pump a lot and then you'd have to prime the thing and every once in a while you get a little squirt out of it. But at the time the water starts coming out, you're tired and you have to quit and you lose all your suction power, <laughs> amen. <laughs> That's the way a lot of Christian lives are, man. I mean, we got to work ourselves up and work up and just about the time we begin to start seeing some results of it, you get tired and, and all of a sudden you lose everything you've got. And that's the way a lot of Christians are. They're just forced. But the Bible says it's supposed to be springing up unto everlasting life. So some of these things that we're sharing, I promise you, will give you keys about why things have not worked better than what they have and about how to get them functional. Out of 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, this is a scripture we used last night. We've got like precious faith with Peter. Peter didn't have more faith than what I've got. All of us have been given the measure of faith, according to Romans chapter 12, verse 3. I have the same faith that was in Peter when he walked along and that his shadow touched people and that they were raised up and people came off of sick beds and demons were cast out of people. You have that same faith that Peter used to raise Dorcas from the dead. Amen. You have the same faith that Peter used on the day of Pentecost when he preached and 3,000 souls were saved. You had the same faith when he grabbed that man by the hand at the gate of the temple and lifted him up and said, walk, and 5,000 people were born again. You have the same faith that enabled him to stand before Caiaphas and all of them and say, you judge yourself, which is better? Should we obey God or man? boldness, amen, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus, amen. amen. They could tell that all these guys, they're acting just like that guy we just crucified. They, they recognized Jesus in them. And, Paul, and Peter said that we have like precious faith with him. And then he begins to tell us how to get that faith operative. In verse 2 it says, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, this is really important. This is just the introduction to this chapter. But you need to understand that these words aren't in there just wasting space. Boy, there's a powerful lesson to learn in this. Grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Now, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of people today that are seeking peace. I believe that basically every person in here, one of the reasons you're here, you may not have put it into words tonight, but you're here because you desire peace in your heart. There's turmoil. Satan fights you with things, and praise God, you know that Jesus is the answer, and you're here seeking to be at peace with God, at peace with yourself, to have victory over problems and things that fight you. I have people that come to our services and want me to pray for them that they'll get peace. You don't pray for peace. The Bible doesn't tell you to pray that God will give you peace. We used this last night out of Galatians 5.22 that the Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, and peace. It's a fruit to be produced. It's your nature. It's something that's supposed to be just bubbling up out of you. It's a part of the life that God's committed unto you. You don't have to pray for peace. And any of you that are sitting here having turmoil and struggling in your life and you're desiring God to give you peace, you see, you're going about it the wrong way. God's already given it to you. How do you release it? That's the proper way to approach the thing. How do you release the ability of God and get the peace of God functional in your life? Well, this scripture right here says that it's not through having somebody lay hands on you and pray for it. It says it is not in coming to church. Now, coming to church is important, but coming to church isn't going to give you peace. I can show you lots of people who go to church don't have peace. Reading the Bible isn't going to give you peace. Amen? Not unless you take the Word and put it on the inside of you and do the things that it says. But you see, we've tried to find all of these gimmicks 
People continually are trying to buttonhole me. A lot of ministers, when they minister, and I'm not knocking this, okay, because it helps people retain what they say, but they always got steps to everything they do. Step one through eight or whatever, you know. And there's nothing wrong with that. But many people have become so conditioned to have steps to things that they're just wanting something mechanical that they can operate. Give me a step. Give me something to do. You know, give me anything mechanical that I can do. Don't tell me just to seek the Lord. They want to do anything, see, except seek the Lord. But some things, brother, you just can't give step one, two, three, four, five, and like that. A person just has to get before God, and there's no substitute for seeking God. Nobody's steps or anything else. And people are always wanting something that they can do for peace. This right here says that grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And there is no exception to that. If you're going to want peace in your life, you've got to get the knowledge of God functional on the inside of you. I'm not talking about knowledge about God, but you're going to have to reach a place where your mind is stayed upon God. Isaiah 26, 3 says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusteth in him. So anybody here doesn't have perfect peace. I mean God's kind of peace. If you're believing for finances, if you're believing for a job, if you're believing for healing, if you're believing for anything, and if there isn't perfect peace in your heart, you know where the problem is? That your mind isn't stayed upon God, that your mind isn't stayed upon the knowledge of God. Now, you may think, oh, but brother, it's this other problem or it's this or that, but that's what the Scripture says. The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. If you don't have perfect peace, your mind isn't stayed upon God. Now, your mind might be stayed on things about God, but it's not stayed upon God. There's a man in Omaha, Nebraska, that has a TV station there. And he's just in the process of getting his TV station on the air. And he was listening to us on the radio one day, and I was talking about meditating the Word of God, which is similar to the things we're talking about. Meditation is keeping your mind stayed on the truths of the Word of God and going over and over. And as I was talking about it, you know, the Bible says that if you meditate in this book of the law day and night that you observe to do according to all that is written therein, then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. Joshua 1.8. And I, and I was ministering on the radio and saying, there is no exception to that. If you are meditating in the Word day and night, you are prosperous and you are having good success. And if you aren't prosperous and if you aren't having good success, you are not meditating on the things of God. Anyway, this guy got mad. I mean, he got real mad because, I mean, he was seeking God with everything he had. He said he turned the radio off and he just got really upset with me because he sat there and says, I'm thinking on the things of God. And he just rejected that. And anyway, later on, that was early in the morning, and later on that day, as he was driving along, he was upset over his financial situation. It looked like Satan was coming against the ministry and trying to stop it. And anyway, as he had been praying, he prayed all day long. From the time he heard that radio program till late in the afternoon, he spent all day praying. But all of a sudden, the Lord opened up his understanding, and he says, Lee, what are you praying about? He was praying about the problem. He had been praying the problem and meditating and going over and over the problem. Now, he was talking to God about it. He was talking about it to God, but he wasn't praying the answer. He didn't really have his mind stayed upon God and upon God's answer and upon the knowledge of God that God had given him to overcome that thing. He had been praying, but he had been praying his problem all day long. You all understand that? And he'd been before God all day long saying, Oh, God, look at this situation. And what are we going to do? And thinking about the situation and thinking about the situation. And finally, the Lord showed him. He says, You haven't been meditating on me. You've been meditating on the problem all day. Just exactly what we were saying. And anyway, he finally said, Oh, me. And he agreed with the Lord. And he turned it around. And he began to start thinking about the Lord and about the answer. And instantly, he began to start seeing his finances turn around. And things were completely changed. Now, brothers and sisters, there may be some of you say, but brother, I don't think in sin, and I don't go out here, and I don't look at pornography, and I don't do this, and I don't do that. That may not be your problem, but what is your mind stayed upon? You can even be stayed on good things about God. Do you know people that work in this ministry, I know this from a fact in my own life, in the life of the staff that we have working for us. You can get so involved in the technicalities of changing the light bulbs and making sure that everything's working and cleaning the bill and keeping the books and making sure that everybody's here. You can be involved totally in God's work and not keep your mind stayed upon God. There's a difference. 
And so what I'm talking about that you have to have the knowledge of God on the inside of you. I'm not talking about that you, that you are out here living in sin, but I'm saying that you can sit there and have your mind filled with vanity. You can have your mind filled with things round about God and yet not be really zeroed in on the knowledge of God. The promise is that if your mind is stayed upon Him, you'll be in perfect peace. Anybody that doesn't have perfect peace tonight needs what we're talking about. You need to go back and get your thinking stayed upon God. An example of what we're talking about is in the economy today. A lot of people are bothered by the economy. And a lot of people are beginning to try and hold back and to do this. And they aren't going to step out and believe God. They wouldn't expand. They wouldn't do this. They wouldn't do that. Because fear of what the economy is doing. Well, the Lord brought forth a prophecy in one of our meetings about two and a half years ago, and this really helped me. Because what the Lord said, He said that all you see happening today is a fulfillment of my word. I said that I'd take the wealth of the ungodly and lay it up for the just. He said that the ungodly are losing control of the world's finances, and it's coming to the just. But what's happening... But you see, what's happening is the news media isn't reporting the prosperity that's coming to the believer. All they're doing is reporting the panic that's happening to the unbeliever because they're losing control of the finances. They aren't telling you about the CBN network that operates on a budget of, I don't know, $20 million a month or whatever. Oral Roberts has to have $8 million a week to keep in operation. They aren't telling you about all that kind of prosperity. I mean, things are being done today, brothers and sisters, that could not possibly have been done 10 years ago. Where's all the finances coming from? God doesn't counterfeit the United States currency. God isn't making money. That's, that's dishonest. God's not going to make that money. Where is it coming from? It's coming from the ungodly. It's coming out of Wall Street. It's coming out of all of these great people that have been reservoir of the devil, hoarding all of the financial system. They're losing it. And they don't know where it's going. But I do. Amen. It's going to the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, you see, if you'll take that kind of knowledge, and you can go to the Word of God and verify that that's an exact principle that's listed in the Word of God. Now, if you're thinking that way, every time you hear a bad report about, oh, the interest rate's going up, and it looks like recession, and it looks like depression, and it looks like this and that, ever, if you take the knowledge we just shared and then look at the facts, you feel like shouting, amen. You feel like, well, praise God, if they're in recession, I know where it's going, amen. And you can get excited about it. But... If you don't have that knowledge of God, and if the only knowledge you're filling yourself with is the knowledge that the carnal people are saying and what the world is reporting, you must operate in fear because that's what that knowledge generates. You can't act above your knowledge. Now, you need to understand how your mind works. You cannot act in something above your knowledge. The Lord said this in many different places. Proverbs 29, I believe it's verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. In other words, where you haven't been able to grab a vision or wrap your mind around something, get a mental picture and understanding of what's happening, you'll perish. You've got to have a vision. God's got to reveal knowledge to you before you can operate on something. Like one of the examples that I use, you know, is a, a water blivet. When I was in the army, we used to use water blivets. And if I was to ask you to go get me some water from a water blivet, most of you in here would just give me a blank stare because you don't know what a water blivet is. How are you going to act on something if you don't know what it is? You see, you can't do that. Can everybody relate to that? You, if I told you right now to go get me some water from a water blivet, most of you would be totally at a loss of what to do because you don't know what a water blivet is. You'd have to go find out, look it up, or do something, or ask somebody who's in Vietnam that's been around those kind of things to be able to understand what I was asking you to do, okay? But now if I told you what a water blivet is, just a real simple explanation. They came in 500-gallon sizes and 1,000-gallon sizes. They're just big old black uh, cylinder-looking things that were made out of rubber that were filled with with water, drinkable water, and they'd fly them in by helicopters that had a spigot on one end, and as you let the water out, the air pressure from the outside would collapse the things, and when it got empty, they'd haul it off. Now, that's not a real good explanation, but anyway, it gives you some kind of a picture. See, I've explained it. I've imparted some knowledge unto you, and if you came across one of those now, you could act on it. Everybody follow what I'm saying? You can't act on anything you don't have knowledge of. 
even though you have the life and the faith of God on the inside of you, if you don't have God's knowledge about the economy, then you will function on the knowledge that you do have. You will function on the world's knowledge. You'll operate in fear. And then you'll have somebody stand up in the pulpit and say, you shouldn't be afraid. You ought to believe God. And so you get convicted and say, I ought to believe God. God's my source. But you don't have knowledge about what's happening. See, you don't know have the knowledge to put what's happening in the world into perspective. And until you get that knowledge, brothers and sisters, you can't operate on it. Grace and peace are directly tied to your knowledge. If the knowledge that is in you is the knowledge of the world, you're in trouble. And this is exactly where the Christian realm has been. We've been ignorant concerning the things of God. We've been wise concerning the things of the devil. We've filled ourselves with the knowledge of the devil. And that's the reason that it's so easy to operate in the devil's system and it's so hard to operate in God. Did you know for a believer it ought to be easier for you to operate in God's system than in the world? Did you know it ought to be easy to believe God and it ought to be hard to disbelieve God? And yet I could say that most Christians wouldn't feel that way. Most Christians feel like that whatever your first reaction is, do the opposite, and that's God. You ever heard people say that? Boy, if that's so, that's because you've got an unrenewed mind and you haven't filled yourself with the knowledge of God. You can renew yourself to the point that, praise God, your first reaction is God. Amen. The only knowledge you've got on the inside of you is God's knowledge. We can do that, brothers and sisters. Grace and peace is multiplied unto us through the knowledge of God. If you are lacking peace, it's because you have not kept your mind stayed upon God and upon God's promises, upon God's things. You've been listening to the world and operating the world the way the world talks about. Out of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God the Father. It says, Let us consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you also be wearied and faint in your mind. Have any of you ever felt weary? Amen. Don't raise your hand. Anybody ever felt weary? Any of you ever felt like fainting in your mind? You know where the problem is? You didn't consider Jesus. The word consider means to take into account, to think upon, to dwell upon. It says, consider him lest you be wearied and faint in your mind. If you're feeling weary, if you're feeling like fainting, you have not kept your mind stayed upon God. It's simple. Well, the things we're talking about so, tonight are so simple that we've had to have somebody to help us to misunderstand them all this time. Amen. I mean, it's just simple. You think God's Word, and brothers and sisters, you're going to get God's Word. Proverbs chapter 22, I believe it's verse 7, says, For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. The way you think is the way you're going to be. How are you? Are you well? Or are you sick? If you're sick, did you know you've been thinking sick? Now, I know sometimes people get condemned by the things I say. I'm not saying this to condemn you. I love you. If you'll stick with us, we're going to edify you and build you up. But first of all, you've got to see you need. Amen. First of all, you've got to know that, brothers and sisters, if there's a problem, it's not God that missed it. I tell you, the things of God are simple. There's nothing hard about it. It's just very simple. If we got problems, it's because we've been thinking problems. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, you may not have been thinking, well, I want cancer. I want cancer. You may not have been thinking that way, and so some people say, Brother, I didn't want this cancer. I didn't ask for it. But did you know that the Bible says out of James chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. If you've been thinking strife, if you've been dwelling in strife, if you've operated in anger and been dwelling in anger, did you know that you opened up the door to every evil work? Cancer is an evil work. You're opening up the door to cancer. You're opening up the door to heart attack. You're opening up the door to financial problems. You're opening up the door to anything. Now, you may not have said, cancer, come get me, but we have knowingly dwelt upon strife and upon other things, and it's because we have been thinking in Satan's realm that Satan has got dominion in our life. There's no exceptions to it. Amen? Not everybody's amen in that, but that's true anyway, praise God. 
That's the truth. Did you know that even medical doctors today are saying that they are proving that over, over 90%, and I've heard some estimates as high as 95, 98% of all sickness and disease is emotional related. Now that's not to say that it's psychosomatic. When people say that something's psychosomatic, they mean that there is no physical problem. It's all just a mental. You just think you've got a problem. Give you a sugar pill and it'll heal it. No, that's not true. Cancer is a real problem. It's a physical problem, but it's, a, it's caused by emotional things. Like take, for instance, colitis. If any of you ever heard of colitis, that's where people have problems in their colon and they correct it by going in and taking out part of the uh, colon and things like that. It's not functional, so by surgery they remove part of it. Colitis, and medical doctors agree with this, colitis is caused by stress upon a person. What actually happens is God made the physical body to function so that when you get in an extremely dangerous or fearful position, your body will immediately go to produce an adrenaline and other hormones. The purpose of it is to give you the ability to either fight or run. Amen? <laughs> adrenaline swells the blood vessels to your muscles and it shrinks the blood vessels to your stomach, to your intestines, and to things like that. Uh, parts of your body that you don't have to use to fight. And it, it prepares you to either do something supernatural or to get up and run, amen. Like I saw on TV one time a man who had a heart condition and was told not to exercise or do anything, and as he got out of his car, a little boy was playing and some pipes rolled down a hill and pinned him under one of these huge pipes. And this man, before he thought about it, went over there and he just got excited and lifted that pipe up and this little girl that was with that boy pulled him out from under there and saved his life. And they came out and interviewed him later, and they tried to get three men who were in good condition to lift that pipe, and three men couldn't lift that pipe. And yet here's a 50 or 60-year-old man that had heart trouble and wasn't supposed to do anything. He just lifted that thing like there was nothing to it. He went back over and tried to lift it and couldn't budge it. And the doctor said that it was because adrenaline was flowing. Adrenaline gives you that supernatural ability because it puts all of the energy of the body to the muscles and takes it away from your intestines, from your stomach, and things like that. Now, that's good if the problem is resolved, amen. You either fight and win or you get killed and it's over with, praise God. <laughs> and the problem is resolved in short order. But today... People are having those same kind of reactions through stress. Stress is fighting against people, and because they're keeping their mind stayed upon the things of the world, fear is coming upon them. They're having stress stimulate their hormones, and adrenaline is being produced, and it doesn't go away in a day's time. It doesn't go away in a week's time or a month. Some people live under continual stress and turmoil, and what happens is the blood vessels to the intestines stay shrunk, and that's what they call colitis. And you go in and cut it out, and it is nothing but a stress-related disease. And doctors are saying that over 90% of things, even cancer, is being cured today. And there are documented cases of cures of people that they turned around and started resisting stress in their life. And brothers and sisters, there's no reason that a believer ought to have any stress because the Bible says he'll keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him. The reason believers are coming under that is because we aren't keeping our mind stayed on God. We've come into the same trap that the world is. We just let the knowledge of the world dominate us. We watch the same soap operas, the same junk and filthiness and perversion on TV. We go to the same source to get your news that the world goes. You listen to the same junk at work. Man, it'll kill you. It'll destroy you. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. It's not that you don't have the life of God. You do have the life of God, but the life of God has to go through your brain. The Spirit has no direct access to the physical realm. If this Bible's laying right there, and if I want to move that Bible and pick it up, did you know my spirit has no right or privilege to touch that Bible? My spirit is a spirit. John chapter 3 says, That which is born of the spirit is spirit, and that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and never the twain shall meet. That's my own little interpretation, but that's true. The flesh is flesh, and the spirit is spirit. They are not the same. The bridge between the physical realm and the spiritual realm is the soul. The soul can operate in the physical realm, or it can operate in the spiritual realm, or it can operate in both at the same time. Your soul is an important part of you. It can go back and forth. And if my spirit wants that Bible picked up, it's got to get my brain in gear and tell my brain to do something with this body, and this physical body it has to pick that thing up. A spirit doesn't have any right to go over there and move that thing. Somebody says, Brother, what about the occult? 
in the occult. They can levitate tables and they can move things without a physical body touching it. No, a physical body's still involved because to do that, you've got to have a medium sitting there with their soulish man releasing all of these words and speaking these things and doing something. A soul is still involved. Satan can't do anything in the physical without some physical body and soul submitting to him. Same thing as God. God can't do anything in this physical earth unless somebody submits to him. Well, oh, that's a whole other teaching. I wish I could have time to get off on that. Yeah. <laughs> Some people think, Brother, God can do whatever he wants to. That's not true. Right. You know, my son got in trouble in his Christian school because he's, he's behind in Bible from all the rest of them. Here's a preacher's kid behind in Bible. <laughs> and the reason is because he knows more Bible than that dumb book does. Like they had this one question, God can do, and then they had a blank. And one answer was nothing, and the other answer was anything. And Joshua knew better than that. He says, neither one of those are right. <laughs> he wasn't going to get tricked on that, praise God. Because the Bible says God can't lie. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 6, it says he can't change. He can't violate his word. He's magnified his word above all of his name. There's certain things God can't do. He can't become a liar. Amen. Amen. So you see, he was just understanding the word better than the people that wrote the book. There's certain things God can't do. <laughs> God committed certain power and authority unto us. Anyway, I'm getting off the subject. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world. That's what we're talking about. It's not being conformed to this world, the way it thinks and stuff. Well, how do you keep from being conformed? being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. If you want to get out of the world's way of thinking, you've got to transform yourself by the renewing of your mind. Your spirit's already received the life of God, but your brain doesn't know it. And until your brain knows it, your brain is the central control of your system. It's the master control. You are going to be what you think. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, brothers and sisters, if you're thinking the way the world thinks, although you've got the life of God on the inside of you, the world's going to dominate you. And this has been the problem. See, we've been... I'm still back in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. We've been wanting grace and peace, but we've been thinking doubt and unbelief. We've been thinking fear. We've been meditating the way the world thinks, and we say, God, why don't I have grace and peace? Because you've been thinking fear. You've been thinking st struggle, turmoil. You've been listening to everybody else. If you plant your crops and it rains and rot, rots it, don't go listen to the other farmers talk about all of the bad luck they're having. Go to the Word of God, amen, that your seed won't rot, that God will bless your field. And you think nothing but God's Word, and I guarantee God will resurrect that seed if He has amen. to. Amen. Charles Capps did that. Amen. Charles Capps, man, everybody else seed rotten. Charles Capps resurrected that seed from the dead, speaking life over it, praise God. And he had a crop and nobody else did. You know why? The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, to be carnally minded. Carnally minded doesn't mean sinful minded. Now, sin is carnful, carnal, okay? But not everything that's carnal is sinful. Carnal means all the five senses, what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. If you plant your crop and if it rains, the natural laws tell you that thing's going to rot. That's not sinful to think that, but that's carnal knowledge. If you've got a covenant with God, you can choose to think carnally, think what the natural laws say, and if that's what you think, that's the way it'll be. Or you can choose to think God's way, and you can sit there and say, No, sir, whatever I set my hand unto is blessed. Amen. Then I'll sow and reap a hundredfold in the same year. Praise God. And if all you think is spiritually minded, Romans 8, 6, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. If all you think is spiritually minded, that's Word of God minded, all you can have is life and peace. Amen. That's all you can have, brothers and sisters. If you're having any other results other than life and peace, guess what? You had not been spiritually minded. Am I condemning you? No, I'm saying that, man, that's... That's not to condemn you. That's just saying this has been where the problem is in. We haven't kept our minds stayed upon God. 
This is a lifestyle. The Bible says the just shall live by faith, not just release a little squirt of faith, not come to church and get everybody to pray over you one time. You're going to have to enter into a relationship where you think, meditate day and night the Word of God. Psalms chapter 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And if he meditates day and night, then the next verse says, He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Now, a lot of us want verse 4 or verse 3 where we prosper, but we aren't willing to meditate day and night. We've got to get to the point where our mind is stayed upon him. And then as you think in your heart, you will be. We simply haven't been filling ourselves with the knowledge of God. Let's go on. Man, I'm not getting very far. This is all introduction. We're fixing to get on the main thing we're after here, okay? Verse 3 says, According as His divine power... The word according means in proportion to or to the degree of. That's what the dictionary says. It says, According as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue. And then verse 4 shows us that the knowledge of Him are these exceeding great and precious promises. The Word of God is the knowledge of Him. It's the wisdom of God. Luke chapter 11, Jesus quoted Old Testament Scripture and He says, As also said the wisdom of God. And then He quoted the Old Testament. The Word of God is the wisdom of God. It's the knowledge of God. So all things that pertain unto life and godliness are given unto us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. Now you've already received the life of God. Your spirit man's already complete. You've already got all the healing power on the inside of you that you'll ever have. You'll never get any more God. You'll never get any more anointing. You'll never get any more anything. Amen. Now I've had people prophesy to me that you're going to enter into a double anointing. Things like this. Well, I receive those prophecies because I understand what they mean is I'm going to enter into operating in twice the anointing that I've operated in before. But the truth is, brothers and sisters, that when I got called, I got anointed. And I'm not going to get anointed again. I'm already anointed. Now, I may operate more of that anointing. It may double and triple. It's not that the anointing's doubling and triple. It's that I'm getting twice as good, amen, as operating in the things that I was before. Everybody follow that? I've already got the life of God right here, but it's going to be released directly proportional to the knowledge that I have. And herein lies the problem. Boy, this has set me free. This has turned me on because I used to thank God, why don't you do something? Now I know why God doesn't do anything, amen. It's because I'm so piddling ignorant. And I found out where the problem was. I get in the Word of God and I renew myself and praise God, I can start seeing the power of God released. I found out that God wasn't my problem. I found out that my ignorance was my problem. And praise God, I can do something about my ignorance. Amen? Amen. I'm not stupid. There's just some things I don't know, and I can get in the Word of God, and I can learn, praise God, and so can you. And when God showed me this, I mean, I started digging in the Word of God, and I can truthfully say that now things that I used to struggle over are easy, not because there's a lot more faith. It's the same faith that I was using back then, brothers and sisters, but now I've got so much more knowledge about how that faith works. And I've learned so much that I'm so much more confident in it. There's just not the fear. There's not as many avenues that Satan has against me, and things are working freely today, whereas they used to be struggles. I'm growing and increasing in the knowledge that God has given to me. And so it says, everything that pertains unto life and godliness is given unto us through the knowledge of Him that has called us to glory and virtue. As you learn the knowledge of God, then it's easy to believe Him. I believe that your faith is directly proportional. It's tied to your knowledge. One reason we're having so much trouble releasing faith is because we don't know God well. Like, for instance, before we came into the truth and we were back in a denomination and we believed that God was the one that killed your children. God was the one that knocked these people down. God's the one that put poverty on you. God's the one that made you sick to teach you something. If you believe that, did you know that gives you a warped impression of God? It gives you an impression of God that He's an ogre, that He's mean, that He's cruel, that He's strict. And it makes you want to kind of stay away from it. Now, with that kind of knowledge, there is no way that faith is going to flow freely. 
Because you may say, well, I know God's got power, but I don't know if he'd do it for me. Why don't you know if he'd do it for you? Well, because I haven't been good enough. I haven't done this. See, we were taught that God had a conditional type of love. God loves you as long as you're good, and when you aren't good, God's mad. That's not true. That is not true. God doesn't impute sin unto you. Man, I wish I had time to get on that. We may do that before it's over with, praise God. But see, that's the problem. A lot of people think that way. And if that's the kind of knowledge you have, it's hard to trust somebody that you aren't sure is on your side. Amen. Amen. Now, I know all Christians say, Brother, I believe God loves me, but you believe he loved you so much that you're afraid he's going to kill your children to teach you something. That's not real love, amen. You see, we had a warped impression. And as you begin to find out that God wasn't the, your problem, that God loves you, immediately faith just begin to flow. You begin to start believing for more and more. You begin to expand and reach out and begin to see things happen because you learn that it was not God's nature to be against you, that God was for you. Amen? You all following this? Let's take an example about Abraham. This blesses me because Abraham... I look back at Abraham's life and I see how that he's the father of faith unto all of us is what the scripture says. And then it also says out of Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, it says, John the Baptist was the greatest man that was ever born among Old Testament days, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven, that's talking about me, is greater than John the Baptist. John the Baptist was greater than Moses, than Elijah, than Abraham, than Enoch. All of those guys all rolled into one, and I'm greater than all that. Amen. amen. So are you. If you're the puniest saint that ever breathed, amen, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John the Baptist. So I saw all of that, but I saw me struggling, and I saw Abraham just, I mean, walking in the power of God, and Abraham receiving these miracles and doing all of these things. And I got to wondering, how come... <laughs> If what I've got is greater than what Abraham had, how come it seems like Abraham saw some greater manifestations of things than what I've seen? Well, it's all tied to this same thing that we're talking about, the knowledge, what he thought upon. Let's look over here in Romans chapter 4, and I'll show it to you. You can see this in these passages of Scripture. Romans chapter 4, verse 18. It says, Who against hope believed in hope. This is speaking about Abraham. And when he received the promise of having his son, Isaac, it says, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. The word, so shall thy seed be, that was a scripture. That was his promise. That was his written word. God spoke to him and says, if you can count the stars that are in the sky or the number of grains of sand on the seashore, then so shall your seed be. That was God's word to him. And he meditated on God's word day and night. According to that which was spoken, so shall I see be. Five words. But man, he meditated on that and he meditated on it day and night. And that's what he based his faith on. And it says, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. The word consider means to take into account, to think upon, to rely upon. He did not take into account the fact he was 99 years old when God spoke to him that he was going to have a child. Now, most of us think, oh, Abraham, what a great man of faith to sit there and look at the situation and see how impossible it was and still believe God. Abraham didn't think of the situation. Abraham, now, y'all take this in context, okay? Don't get upset with me. Abraham wasn't all as, as hot a believer as what we think. I mean, the guy sat there and was going to renounce his wife and let Pharaoh take her in and commit adultery with her to save his own neck. He went into Hagar and had a child that God never intended him. Now, I mean, Abraham did some dumb stuff, amen? Now, I'm not against Abraham. He's a brother. I love the guy. And I mean, he could say a few things about me, too. But I'm just saying... <laughs> that Abraham was human and Abraham made mistakes. It wasn't that Abraham just had this great faith that overcame all of his fears. He didn't have any fears because he had disciplined himself to such a degree. He didn't think about the fact that he's 99 years old. Glory. Never occurred to him that he was too old to have a child. That's what this said. He considered not his own body, now dead when he was about 100 years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He didn't look over at Sarah and say, God, have you looked at Sarah lately? Have you seen Sarah? 
she's pushing 90 years old and she's going to have a child. He didn't consider those kind of things. And brothers and sisters, if you don't consider those things, Satan can't tempt you with them. Amen. Satan tempts you with your carnal knowledge. Did you know the Bible says, So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. Romans chapter 10 says, How can they believe on Him whom they have not heard? The answer is they can't. You cannot believe without hearing the Word of God. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed by the Word of God that liveth and abideth forever. You had to hear the Word of God to be born again because the Word of God had faith in it and you had to grab hold of God's faith to be able to get saved. You can't get saved without God imparting the knowledge to you about how to get saved. Now that's established fact through the Word of God. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Well, on the other coin, doubt and unbelief also comes by hearing. You can't get doubt and unbelief. It's not born in you. Amen. Now, brothers and sisters, I could get into a big theological discussion, okay? But I'm just saying this, that you are born with a capacity for sin, but you have to be taught well how to sin. You have to be taught to be prejudiced. Did you know it? Do you know, I was raised in a home that, man, we didn't care any difference between whites and black. I, well, my favorite person when I was a kid was a uh, black lady that was a maid for us. Nobody could touch me and pull my teeth but this black lady, amen. I mean, I, I was just dogmatic about that. And they, I was nearly grown before I found out there was people that had prejudice over stuff like that. I wasn't taught that. You've got to be taught prejudice. Did you know it? Amen. God doesn't make you prejudiced. You have to be carefully taught that kind of stuff. You have to be taught to operate in strife and hatred and things like that. Now, you have a capacity for it, and I guarantee you, you get around it a little while and you can pick up on it, but you were taught it. I can show you our children. When Joshua was three years old, he'd never been around strife. He didn't know that you're supposed to fight people over your toys. We were around adults. He didn't have many kids to play with, and all of the adults loved him and always just treated him the way he's supposed to be. And he was three years old at Christmas when he got around his relatives, and they started taking things from each other and hitting each other and, you know, yelling at each other, I'm going to kill you for taking this thing away. Josh had never heard that, and I watched him. And he just was shook. For the first couple of days, he just stood there stunned. But after two days, he learned, amen. <laughs> And when they took something away from him, he took it right back and said, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> Three years old before he ever operated in strife over anything. And I can tell you exactly where he got it from. He was taught it. That's not natural inside of a child. That has to be instilled in them. Greed and selfishness and anger. You don't have moods that you're born with. You were taught all those moods. You were trained those things. That's the way that you were taught to react to things, and that's the way you did it. Amen? Boy, there's a lot of good things could be said about that. But anyway, the point that I'm saying through this is that those things aren't natural for you to be that way. You were taught to do that. Satan comes at you through knowledge just the same as God works in your life through knowledge. And that's a blessing because if you cut off Satan's knowledge, you can cut off Satan's temptation. Now, it's one thing to know how to overcome temptation. Praise God for knowing how to overcome temptation. But the better way is to not even get tempted. Amen. That's right. And did you know most Christians don't even know that you can keep from getting tempted? You can. You can reach a point to where Satan isn't even tempting you over things. Amen. Some of you are looking at me like a calf looking at a new gate. <laughs> Let's look over here at Hebrews chapter 11, and I'll show this to you. Hebrews chapter 11. This is talking about Abraham, Enoch, Noah, and all of these guys. And in verse 14, it says, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. He says, if they had been mindful, that's talking about their mind, if their mind had been full of the country that they came out of, they would have had opportunity to have returned. This scripture links opportunity to go back on the promises of God or temptation is linked directly to what you're mindful of. You see that? God gave Abraham a promise to leave Ur of the Chaldees, go out into a land that he would afterward receive. 
Abraham thought on the promise. He kept that promise in front of him. Abraham kept seeing millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of descendants living in that land. That's what he thought on. That's what he imagined. That's what he meditated day and night. And this scripture says, if he had have gone back and started thinking about Ur the Chaldees and thought, I wonder what they're doing in Ur the Chaldees tonight, amen. I wonder who moved into my great fancy mansion that I had there. I wonder about all the friends that I left behind. I wonder if they think think I'm crazy for doing this. If Abraham had a thought on those kind of things, he would have been tempted to go back on the promises. But, turn this verse around, since he wasn't mindful of the country that he came out of, Abraham never was tempted to go back on the promises of God because he didn't consider those kind of things. Do y'all see that? Boy, that turns me on. That really does something for me. Because, like, let's apply this to our lives. Let's say, for instance, sickness. Did you know the only reason sickness dominates people is because we've been taught so well how to respond to sickness? You've been taught from the time you was a little tiny child that when you get something wrong, you know, immediately start pampering that thing, start giving in to it, start saying, my sickness, my disease. Brothers and sisters, if we were ignorant in all of that, if you didn't know how to get sick, you wouldn't get sick. Now, I know that sounds too simplistic for a lot of people. A lot of people think, brother, you're just out in left field. you just got your head in the sand. You've been missing the truth. But I firmly believe that based on this scripture. If all you thought was, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. If that's all you thought, Romans 8, 6 says, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Spiritual mindedness produces life and peace. Is sickness part of life? No, amen. Is sickness part of peace? No. Only thing you can have if you're spiritually minded is life and peace. It's all that you can have. If all you think is, by his stripes, I'm healed. By his stripes, I'm healed. If that's the only thought that you have, if that dominates you day and night, then all you can be is, by his stripes, healed. Right. Amen. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But you see, Satan hits you with the pain, and immediately you think, oh no, heart attack. <laughs> and you begin to think, oh, my dear Aunt Susie died of heart attack. It runs in the family. I knew this was coming upon me. And you start thinking about things like that, and you think, oh, man, I'll be dumb if I don't go to the doctor over this thing. I better go get something done. And you start seeing yourself fall over dead, and you start rushing to the hospital. Now, if that's what you've thought, boy, you're hurting for certain. You better go to the doctor because you're in trouble. But if the first thing comes to you, you know, it's, I wonder what that is. By his stripes, I'm healed. Amen. <laughs> Do you know, I had a pain, I think it was either last night up here. I don't know what a heart attack's like. Don't you come bend my ear and tell me, okay? <laughs> but I had some pains. I had some pains up here last night so that I couldn't hardly sit there with a straight face. But, you know, I don't care what... I mean, it doesn't make any difference. A pain never killed anybody, amen. I just sat there and said, I don't care what it is. If I have stripes, I'm in. I think on the Word of God, and that I don't even remember when it left. It never... You know, it just doesn't bother me. I have things come at me all the time. I'm not immune to Satan fighting me. He, he tries to get things on me. I just take any of his opportunities, amen. I don't say I'm taking a cold. I just don't take them. I don't catch colds. I dodge them. Amen. <laughs> but see, most of us have been taught so well that when you sneeze, oh, no, a cold's coming on. When I sneeze, I don't think a cold's coming on. I just sneeze. <laughs> doesn't mean you're going to have a cold. If I cough, doesn't mean something bad's happening. It just means I coughed. Amen. 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 I'm convinced, I've said this before, but I just really like this. That one reason eight Adam lived to be 930 years old is because that guy did not know how to die. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. Adam didn't know that at 30 he was getting over the hill. Nobody told him that. Adam didn't know that when he got a gray hair, he didn't know as bad. The Bible says that a uh, hoary head, that's talking about wide-headedness, is a crown of glory if it be gotten in the way of righteousness. Adam didn't know there was anything wrong with that. Adam didn't know that at 60 he was supposed to retire. He didn't know those kind of things. 
He didn't sit there and say, oh, well, we aren't as young as we used to be. <laughs> and when he forgot something, he didn't say, Eve, I must be getting old. I just don't remember as well as I used to. <laughs> Our children, they forget things all the time, and it's not because they're old. Yeah. Forgetting something doesn't mean that you're old. But you see, we've been taught that kind of stuff. And if you go to talking on it, and if you go to seeing yourself sick and decrepit and getting old, and if you go to pampering yourself, and if you go to treating yourself like you're getting old, you'll get what you think. Right. My mother's 69 years old and working for us at least 12 to 15 hours a day. And she's not a perfect example because I stay on top of her, rebuking her and prodding her all the time. <laughs> but I guarantee you, she goes out and she'll play games with us, roll on the ground, we drag her around. I mean, she doesn't act like she's 69 years old. You can't tell it by looking at her. because, And it's because of her attitude. Brothers and sisters, we've swallowed a lie about that kind of stuff. Adam, his children didn't know that they were supposed to get married when they was young and that they was getting too old. They didn't even go out and have a family until they was three and four hundred years old when they'd get married and start their family. <laughs> Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. It took a long time for the devil to get across to people that every winter was a flu season. <laughs> took a long time for that knowledge to grow and increase. Adam didn't know it was flu season. <laughs> you look at America today with all of its great technology, we got more knowledge about sickness and disease than any other people that have ever lived on the face of the earth. And to some degree, it's helped some people. There's probably some of you that are here that have been dead if it hadn't have been for that medical knowledge. But then on the other hand, there's more sickness, there's more disease, there's more varying kinds of sickness and disease today than there has ever been. <laughs> Guess why? Because sickness is talked more, people think more sickness, and as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Amen. The Bible says out of Romans 16, says to be wise concerning that which is good and simple concerning that which is evil. We are wise concerning that which is evil. Everybody in here can tell me all the terrible signs of cancer. I don't know what the signs of cancer are, and don't come tell me, because I'm not going to go to receiving it if I get one of those signs. Amen. Praise the Lord. But if you know all of that kind of junk, and then some symptom comes across your path, what that's going to do is trigger your knowledge, your carnal knowledge, your worldly knowledge, and it's going to give you opportunity to enter into fear, to enter into doubt, do all that. Man, I don't have those opportunities, amen? Because I wouldn't know how to get sick. It's been so long since I've been sick, I don't know how to get sick. Our kids don't know how to get sick. They have never been pampered. When, they, when Satan has fought them, we don't allow them to lay down. We don't smooth their fevered brow and let them suck soda waters and, and wipe all of perspiration off their fevered brow and make it fun for them. Man, when Satan fights them, I guarantee you, we get them up and drag them around the house until they start acting well and say, you're healed in the name of Jesus, and we make them act well. And our kids have learned to hate sickness. They don't play sick. Amen. <laughs> And did you know that as a result, like last, um, I forgot when this was, but we, we held a meeting in, uh, well, I guess it was last August when we were here with Joan A. I think it was. We held a meeting here in Lima, and then we went to uh, Sioux City, Iowa. And the day we left Lima, going to Sioux City, Peter woke up, and real early that morning, he threw up. And he threw up two other times during the day in the van while we was traveling. <laughs> But it was funny because, I mean, Peter would just be going 90 to nothing, playing, running his cars up and down the aisle, and he'd stop and throw up and then just go right back to playing, boy. <laughs> I mean, you could tell that the devil was fighting him. You could tell something was wrong, but Peter, I mean, it doesn't make a lick of difference to him. It doesn't, you know. He doesn't believe in sickness, and he'd get up and go, and you say, are you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. Man, just let me at it, and we'd open up the band door, and boom, there he'd be out playing. And you could tell three times Satan tried something on him, but it was over with. The next day, everything was fine. We still don't know what it was because, you see, all it was was just an opportunity, and we don't take the opportunities. Amen. 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 He doesn't have knowledge. He, if, but I guarantee you, if he'd have done that, and all of a sudden, if fear would have hit him, and he'd have come, oh, Daddy, what's wrong? And if he'd have got discouraged, and if he'd have said, oh, I can't get up and play today, I'm feeling bad, and if he'd have gone to acting sick and gone to thinking sick, he'd have had it. Right. Y'all see that. Amen. That's what this scripture is saying, that if you were mindful of the country you came out of, or if you were mindful of something that is contrary to God's promises, you will have opportunity 
to do those things. But on the other side of that coin, if you aren't even mindful of anything other than the promise, you will not be tempted. I don't ever think sickness, so therefore I'm not tempted with sickness. Honest, I don't, I don't even have to fight off sickness. I walk in divine health, and that's better than divine healing. I just don't get sick because I don't think sickness. It's not a part of me. I don't listen to that kind of junk. You know, our kids, we watch the news every once in a while. Now, we don't watch it much, but when we do watch it, we at least counter the junk that comes across it. And when they come on and says, Anison has a higher level of pain reliever than something else. Our kids, every time they see something like that, they'll say, Jesus has a higher level of pain reliever. <laughs> Amen. they'll immediately plug Jesus in for everything. They aren't going to give Anison the credit for doing what Jesus can do. Amen? I mean, everything they do relates to Jesus. And as a result, we walk free from that. I'm not saying we don't get tempted, and there's times we have to fight some things off, but I tell you, it's very seldom. Amen? We have opportunity we just don't take. Let me show you something else down here about Abraham. This really blessed me. When Abraham offered Isaac his son as a sacrifice... I said, Lord, if what I've got is greater than what Abraham had, how come Abraham was willing to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice? And I tried to be honest with God, and I said, I just wouldn't kill Joshua or Peter. I said, if you told me to do it, I honestly wouldn't do it. I tried to be honest. I said, I'm not trying to be rebellious, but I said, I just can't see myself doing that. And I said, how come Abraham was willing to do it, and what I've got is greater than what Abraham had, and yet he's willing to do something I'm not? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought that way or not, but I think that's healthy to think that way. And I begin to ask the Lord, and the Lord showed me the answer right here out of Hebrews chapter 11. It says in verse 17, By faith Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. I saw a movie one time about Abraham offering up Isaac his son, and... and um, Abraham was doing something and God called out to him and told him to go offer Isaac, his son, as an offering. And in the movie, it showed Abraham turning towards the wall and, I mean, getting his fist and just ramming it into the wall and crying and yelling, Oh, God, no, not Isaac, my son. And it betrayed all of the grief that he had and the misery, and it showed him all night long wrestling with God and crying and bawling and squalling, going through this tremendous agony about, How could I offer up my son? And then in the morning, he finally just you know, drew on the courage on the inside of him and went against all of his feelings and went on his way. And that's kind of the way that I had it pictured. But this right here shows it just the opposite. The truth is, Abraham never one time thought about his son being dead. Amen. It's the same principle. When he was promised Isaac, he never one time considered his own body, now dead nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19 says, He was accounting that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. Abraham, the reason he was so bold to do this is because Abraham, from, for the year before Isaac was born, considered not his own body, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. All he considered was the word of God, so shall thy seed be. He had that promise God gave him so big in front of him that it overshadowed every feeling and every emotion. He wasn't tempted to go another route because he had God's word there. All he was thinking was spiritually minded, so the only result he could get was life and peace. And then after Isaac was born, all he could still think of was that promise. See, Isaac was only the seed, but he wasn't the final product. There were supposed to be entire nations come out through Isaac. And so he kept that promise in front of him. Isaac was approximately 17, 19 years old right here when this happened. And for that many years, Abraham had not been thinking anything except the promise that God gave him that in Isaac, you are going to have entire nations come out of him. Abraham had dominated himself for at least 18 to 20 years. He had done nothing day and night but meditate upon the word of God. The only word he had was, so shall thy seed be. He dominant, meditated on that for 20 years. Can you imagine how strong that guy was? Stronger than horseradish, praise God. I mean, he just meditated on the Word of God. And it says that he accounted that God was able to raise his son up from the dead. In other words, if Abraham had a thought the way I thought, he couldn't have offered his son either. 
If Abraham had a sat down and a pictured himself saying, God, but I can't see my son dead with the blood, the life running out of him. God, how could I put my knife into him and kill him? How could I tell his mother what had happened? How could I stand the grief of being without my only son, the only one that I love? If he would have thought like that, that would have been such a strong hindrance to him. Abraham couldn't have overcome it. But Abraham accounted that God was able to raise him up from the dead. He had the promise so real in front of him, all he could think of is, well, praise God, if God wants to offer him as a sacrifice, he must going to be raised him from the dead. All, see, he just had a positive attitude. All he could think is, well, I know this is my seed, and through him there's going to be entire nations come, so he's got to live. This is going to be exciting to see what God does. Can you see why Abraham is so strong? It's because his thought life was disciplined. He thought upon the Word of God. Brothers and sisters, the same thing applies to us. It's not that faith is hard. Raising the dead isn't hard unless, unless the knowledge that's on the inside of you is associating yourself with the other people, with the world. If you think like the world does, if you think, Lord, I'm only human, I'm just a man. You ever sing that a one believing song? One day at a time, sweet Jesus, is all I'm asking of you. Lord, you know if you're looking below, it's worse now than then. What a dumb song, if he's looking below. Lord, I'm only human. I'm just a man. That's not true. But if you think you're only human, and if you think I'm just a man, what can I do? I guarantee you, although the life of God's on the inside of you, it'll never get out, because a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. If you associate yourself with the world, and if you look at yourself as being just as incapable of doing the miraculous as the world is, then you'll be just as incapable of doing the miraculous as the world is. But if you turn that around, if you begin to think, no, sir, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Right here, I'm wall to wall Holy Ghost. Amen. Here's the fullness of the Godhead dwelling bodily in me. Christ in me, the hope of glory. If God be for us, who can be against us? Amen. He that spared not his only son, but gave him up freely for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You begin to think that way and get a superiority attitude on the inside of you, amen? Superiority not over people, but over the devil, over sickness and disease. When you begin to start seeing who you are in Christ Jesus, when that's the knowledge that's on the inside of you, I guarantee you, you'll rise up and you'll... Your first reaction, if somebody fell over dead, your first reaction ought to be, praise God, an opportunity for Jesus to live big on the inside of me. Amen. And you can do that if you've been meditating on who you are and who God is in you. But if you've been thinking, oh, woe is me. Oh, I just am a poor, ungodly thing. And I'm so weak and I'm so inadequate. And if you're sitting here listening to the junk that the world says, if you, you know, things like people talking about the economy, it's negative, brothers and sisters. You may not be sitting there shaking your head, yes, but I promise you the Bible says out of 1 Corinthians 15, 33, it says... Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. A person that thinks that you can listen to doubt and unbelief and be unaffected, you are deceived. And let me put in a good plug right here. For those of you that are in a doubt and unbelief church, and you're listening to doubt and unbelief because you're going to stay there and win them over, you're deceived. It's chapter 1, and tonight I just want to share some real simple things with you. I don't know anything's real complicated. It's just real simple stuff. But sometimes people, I had somebody come up tonight. I was visiting with some of our partners before the meeting and somebody was talking about how I just made it so simple and that that's what really blessed them. And I told them, I said, that's because I am so simple. You know what? I don't know any real complicated stuff, but boy, what I know is working. And I think sometimes people just make the gospel too simple, I mean, too hard. And the truth is, it's not the real gospel. The real gospel is just real simple. But religion has complicated things. I'm going to share some really simple things with you here in Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> I hesitate to read all of these verses because, man, I've preached an hour on each one of these verses. I want to get down to verse 4. So let me just, let's go to verse 3. 
It says, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter chapter one says, grace and peace is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. Most people pray for things like this. They pray for grace, they pray, pray for peace. I had a couple of people tonight ask me, would you please pray that this would happen and pray that that would happen and I said, no, you don't need prayer. What you need is just knowledge. You need to get into the word of God and renew your mind. And there's people that are praying, like for instance, for healing. And they're asking God to heal them. The Bible says that God's word is health unto all of your flesh and life unto them that find it. In Proverbs chapter four, verses 20 through 22. And it says in Psalms 107, verse 20, that God sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all of their destructions. Matthew chapter eight, a man who said, I don't need you to come touch me, speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus said, I've never seen such great faith. The greatest faith, the best way to receive from God is just to take the truth of God's word and it will change you, it will set you free. And yet the average person does not take that approach. Instead, they want somebody to come wave their hand over you they're praying for God to send revival. They're wanting a glory cloud to descend. They're wanting all these other things. And don't misunderstand what I'm saying. God does use those things. It's because he loves you so much. If the only way that the Lord had that you could receive was just to totally get your mind renewed and stand in the word, there would be a lot of people dying and not receiving because they aren't that serious about God and they aren't seeking God that way. And so you can receive through these special gifts and I am not discrediting that. There's a place for all of it. It's not one or the other, but I'm telling you that you can't count on somebody with a special anointing around to always bail you out. You can count on the word of God to always put you over. And we are specifically trying to redirect people's attention away from receiving from God from the outside and instead start receiving what God has already given you. So this is what this is saying. Grace and peace over in 2 Peter chapter one is multiplied unto you through the knowledge of him. If you don't have peace, if you don't have grace, you don't have the right knowledge. We've got the wrong knowledge. We gotta get our thinking straightened out. And in verse four, it says, talking about Jesus, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. God's will for you is to be delivered from this present evil world. And again, the church has basically, uh, you know, interpreted this, translated it to say that it's all when we get to heaven. What a day that's gonna be. And it's gonna be awesome. And we talk about how wonderful heaven is and heaven is gonna be wonderful. But this says he gave himself to deliver us from this present evil world. You don't have to wait until you get to heaven to begin to experience the blessing and the power of God. Jesus said in the model prayer, he said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God wants you to be walking in absolute total victory now. And did you know that the most opposition against that will come from the church? The church have become masters of explaining away why you can't walk in victory. They will tell you that God's the one who's putting these problems in your life. God made you sick to teach you something. This is God's punishment. God's not answering your prayer because you haven't fasted enough or prayed enough or whatever. And those things are not true. Jesus wants you delivered from this present evil world. He wants you to be living as it is in heaven to be here on earth. That's what he told us to pray. God wants you, well. <coughs> excuse me, he wants you well. He wants you healed. He wants you prosperous. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to have a purpose for your life. And yet it's amazing to me how many Christians don't have this. Why is that? And I've already kind of teased this, but what I'm gonna try and get across tonight is most Christians are praying and asking these things to come as if they are yet to be accomplished. And the truth is God has already done everything. 
The Bible says Jesus is seated at the Father's right hand. He is not there working. He is not healing people. He's not setting people free. Jesus accomplished everything 2,000 years ago, and there's many scriptures. 1 Peter 2, 24, it says, by his stripes we were healed. God isn't healing people tonight. He healed you 2,000 years ago, and that healing isn't out there somewhere that you've got to pray it down or have God stretch forth his hand. God placed the supernatural raising from the dead power on the inside of every single one of you who've been born again. And the things that we're praying for and asking God to do, he's already done. You've already got it. And somebody's saying, well, no, I don't have it. That's because here's the, here's the real crux of the matter that we are, I'm trying to say this nice, but I don't know a nice way to say this. We are carnal. You know, the word carnal to some people just means that you're terrible, you're sinful, it's like a terrible person. The word carnal just means of the five senses. Matter of fact, the word carnal comes from a word carne in the Greek, and that's where we get chili con carne, chili with meat. That's what it's talking about. The word carne, carne means meat. And if you look it up in Strong's uh, dictionary, it just means the flesh as stripped of skin. In other words, not your epidermis, not the skin that you see, but the meat below the skin. That's what the word carne is referring to. And so when it talks about that you're carnal minded, it's saying you're a meathead. <laughs> Amen. But really carnal just means that you are going, you are controlled, dominated by what you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. And this is the problem. The Bible says, that we have already overcome, that we already have the same power on the inside of us that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Ephesians chapter one, verse 18. He says, the same things that I do shall you do also. And I could just go through and quote verse after verse after verse. Most of you in here know that there's more scriptures about victory, prosperity, joy, peace, healing, anointing than what you're experiencing. But the average person can't see those things come to pass because they're looking for them in the physical. When I say that God has already healed you and that he's already done everything, you immediately check your body to see if you got pain, to see if the lump is gone, to see if your eyes can see. And you're looking for this power of God in the physical realm. But I'm telling you, God is a spirit. John 4:24. And God placed this power in your born again spirit, not in your physical body, not in your soulish realm. Now it's in you because it's in your spirit, but I'm saying you can't discern the power of God by just feelings and things like this. You know, I'm amazed how many times people will, will be sitting here praising the Lord and talking about the goodness of God and all of these things. And then right in the middle of all of this, in praise and worship, somebody will go to begging God to come. Oh God, we welcome you. We want your power to come. Just bring your power. And I'm, it just aggravates me when they do that because the Bible says he'll never leave us nor forsake us, that he's always with us. We'll pray these prayers. God, go with us as we leave this place. How's God gonna answer a prayer like that when he says that he's never gonna leave you nor forsake you? And people say, oh, well, I know, I, I know that he said that, but, and what you're saying is, I don't feel it. I don't see it. And because you don't feel it, because no glory cloud has manifested, because you don't have a goosebump going up and down your spine, you wonder if God is here. The truth is God is here, and he's not only here in this building and among us, but he's inside of every one of you, and his fullness is, uh, uh, of his fullness have all we received. John chapter one, verse 16. God is in you in all of his strength and in all of his power. And the average Christian will not receive that because they don't feel it. When I say that you're anointed, most people, well, I don't feel anything. Anointing has nothing to do with what you feel. God has placed his power on the inside of you. And just like this verse is saying, he has already 
His will is for you to be delivered from this present evil world. And everything that it takes for you to live in absolute, total victory, God has already placed on the inside of you. And the only thing that is keeping it from manifesting is not you praying hard, harder, not you living holier or anything. It's based on knowledge. It says, oh, let me turn over to these verses. I quoted them earlier, but in 2 Peter chapter 1, it's saying the same thing. This is said many places. Man, uh, Philemon chapter 1 verse 6 is one of my favorite scriptures. This verse changed my life. But he prayed a prayer and he said, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The way your faith begins to work is when you start acknowledging what's already in you, not when you pray for God to descend and pray for the power of God to be poured out, but when you start acknowledging what he's already done. God has already placed his power on the inside of you. And here in 2 Peter chapter 1, I already used verse 2 where it says, Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of of God and of Jesus our Lord. In verse three, it says, according as his divine power hath given unto us uh, all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that called us to glory and virtue. This says everything that pertains unto life and godliness. What does that include? Everything. Do you need to be healed tonight? That would fall into this category. Do you need to have joy tonight? that would fall into this category. Do you need prosperity? Do you need direction? Everything that pertains to life and godliness has been given unto you through the knowledge of him that has called you to glory and virtue. If you have a deficiency in any area of your life, you've got a knowledge problem. Thank you for that thunderous silence. Again, most people don't believe this. If you believed it, you would be renewing your mind as fast as you possibly can. If it's not a matter of trying to get God to move and God to pour out his spirit and oh God, send revival. Revival's not dependent upon God. Revival is dependent upon you learning what you have in Christ and walking in it. If you find out that you've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead, and he said, you go do the same works and even greater works than I did. You go out and raise a few people from the dead and you'll have all the revival that you can handle. Amen. It's not up to God to send revival and yet the church is praying, oh God, pour out your spirit. God poured out his spirit. It's inside of you. His power is living on the inside of you. But again, most of us, don't believe this because we don't feel it. We go look in the mirror and we think this is, this couldn't be all there is. That's because you're looking in the flesh. You can't see your spirit. You can't see what it's like. But I'm telling you in your spirit, you're awesome. If you're born again, you're already everything that you will ever be in your spirit. And as quickly as you can renew your mind to it, you can experience life here on earth as it is in heaven you can experience being delivered from this present evil world. God has already done his part, but he needs us to understand and renew our minds to this. And this is what this is saying. Everything that pertains unto life and godliness comes through the knowledge of him. And then the next verse says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So this knowledge that he was talking about in verse three is given to us through exceeding great and precious promises. That's talking about the word of God. The word of God contains the knowledge of God. It tells us what we need to know. You know, I was talking to our students today and there was a question that came up and anyway, basically I was just telling them that you know what, uh, there was a time when I was so frustrated because God showed me where he wanted my life to go and where I was was so far from where God was telling me to go that it was just like I was overwhelmed. God, how could I ever get there? How can I cover this distance? And as uh, I was praying about this, I was kneeling around my bed 
and I had my Bible open on my bed and I just opened up my eyes. I was saying, God, how do I get from where I am to where I need to go? And I opened my eyes and I saw my Bible laying on my bed. And the Lord spoke to me and he says, if you'll stick your nose in this book and learn this stuff, it'll teach you everything you need to know. And I just took that as a directive. And I mean, I started pouring into the word of God. I started renewing my mind day and night. And I can truthfully tell you that right now, I'm not trying to get God to do anything. I am just walking with God and God is downloading things and showing me what he wants me to do. And it's, it's miraculous. I was telling our students today that the guy who produces all of Disney's 3D animations and stuff like this, he just happened to get changed through our ministry and he resigned working with Disney and producing all of their things and came. And I'm in a process of doing something and a couple of days ago he walked in and he says, God sent me here to help you. I couldn't pay this guy. I mean, it'd be hundreds of thousands of dollars to pay this guy something. And he just gave up and gave it all up and walked in and now he's helping us do these things. God is just putting stuff together. I'm not asking God, to, oh God, please do this. You just renew your mind and I guarantee you it's, well, I've got a teaching entitled Effortless Change. You change effortlessly if you get in and renew your mind, the word of God will transform you. Your life is going the direction that it's going because of your thoughts. If you don't like the direction of your life, change your thoughts. But most people won't change their thoughts. They will change their prayers. They will beg God a little harder. They will try and act a little better and they'll do all of this. But very few people will get in and renew their mind. I'm telling you, Proverbs 23, 7 says, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Your life is the way that it is because of the way your thoughts are. Yep, that usually goes over about like that. <laughs> Our society's become masters at blaming everybody else. No, you don't understand. I was abused when I was a child. I was sexually assaulted. assaulted. I was raised poor. I had this happen and we blame other things. I'm telling you, you can take people that have been through identical things that you've been through and instead of being defeated and bitter and angry, they are just prosperous. And it's not, it's not because of the circumstances. I'm not saying circumstances aren't a factor, but the Bible teaches that you are the way you are because of the way you think. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3 says, The Lord will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because he trusts in him. If you aren't in perfect peace, if you're depressed, if you're discouraged, if you're beat down, it is not because of what's happened to you, it's because of the way you think about what has happened to you. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. We love to blame other people and say, no, it's somebody else's fault that I'm the jerk that I am, but it's your fault. You've had things happen, but it's the way you think about it. It's the fact that you focus upon it. And it's the fact that most of us are just carnal. We're looking on the outside. And when God says that you are a victor instead of a victim, we say, oh no, God. And we look at the things we've been taught that somehow or another you're in denial. If you don't sit here and fall apart, like a $2 suitcase when things come your way, you, you just are in denial. That's not true. I'm not denying that there's problems in my life, but I am denying that what I see, taste, hear, smell, and feel is all that there is. I am a new person in Christ. There is a spirit on the inside of me, and in this spirit, I've got the same power that raised Christ from the dead. I've got the mind of Christ. I've got a supernatural anointing from God. And I just refuse to live like a mere human being. There's a lot of people that will say, well, you are just a human being. No, I am a human being, but I am not only a human being. I've got one third of me as wall to wall Holy Ghost. And we just aren't using what we've got. I tell you, I just feel like the Lord, people are upset at God. Like, God, you could have changed this. You could have healed this person. You could have made my business work. 
You could have made all of these things happen. That's not true. God has all power, but he gave it to us. He gave us authority. In James chapter four, verse seven, it says, submit yourselves therefore unto God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The devil will flee from you. You can't ask God to rebuke the devil. You can't ask God, no, please get the devil off my back. God said you resist the devil and he will flee from you. If Satan is beating you up, it's because you aren't resisting, because you have bought into a lie that somehow or another Satan is superior and that Satan is stronger than you are. That's not true. It's because of the way you think. If you understood how powerful what God gave you is and that the authority that you've got, I guarantee you, you could drive the devil out of your life and out of your situations and you could be walking in victory. It's our lack of understanding that's causing the problem. Have you ever seen the bumper sticker that says, uh, you know, what you don't know won't hurt you? Well, I guarantee you, that's a lie. What you don't know is killing you. God's people perish for a lack of knowledge. Brothers and sisters, we got to renew our mind. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This isn't just for the preachers. This isn't just for the super saints. This is your reasonable service. Jesus died for us. The least we could do is live for him and make a commitment to turn our lives over to him. And so it's just your reasonable service. And then verse two says, and don't be conformed to this world. The word conform there in the Greek means to pour into the mold. Don't let the world pour you into their mold. Don't let them force your thinking to be like them. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The way you get transformed is to renew your mind, to change your way of thinking. And again, the church doesn't believe this. They say, oh no, the way you get transformed is to fast and to pray and to do all of these things and live holy and quit doing this. If you don't, if you know, you got to quit your drinking, you got to quit this, you got to quit this. And basically it's based on performance and all of this stuff. The scripture makes it very clear that you get transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's the way you think, and that's how you prove the good and the acceptable and the perfect will of God. You know, in a sense, I'm preaching to the choir. This is Friday night, and y'all are the ones who are out here listening to me preach instead of home watching as the stomach turns on the television. <laughs> and so I know that you have a desire for this, but I'm telling you that this is what we've got to do is we've got to get our mind renewed, and we've got to recognize that everything that God gives us is in the spiritual realm. You can't just go look in a mirror and God says you can do these things. You can't see it in the mirror. You can't feel it based on just your feelings. You have to take the word of God and use this as a way of seeing into who you are in Christ. This is like a spiritual mirror. If you wanna see if your hair is combed, you have to go look in a mirror. You can't go by how you feel. And if you want to see what you're like in the spiritual realm, you've got to hold up this word and look at it. And when it says greater works than what I have done, will you do because I go to the Father? You have to believe that, whether you feel it or not. And you have to start speaking. You have to resist the devil and he will flee from you. He won't flee when you talk about Jesus. He will flee from you when you use the name of Jesus and rebuke him and take authority. You have to resist the devil. You have to stand up against it. I prayed with some people tonight who just are sitting there so passive. I have people come to me all of the time and it's like they, they want to tell me how pitiful they are. You don't understand, I can't do anything. And they just spend lots of time trying to get me to feel as bad about their situation as they are, thinking that somehow or another through sympathy or pity, it will motivate me to pray for them and stuff. And my thought when I hear all of this is that you know what, you aren't resisting the devil. You are just letting the devil run smooth over you and you, you're waiting on somebody else to get it for you. 
You're just, at, you're coming and asking me. I've prayed. It doesn't work for me. See if it'll work for you. You aren't resisting the devil. Man, you need to be fighting the devil. You need to be resisting sickness and poverty and depression and discouragement. I had somebody ask me yesterday, I think it was about, don't you ever get discouraged? And I said, I get tempted to be discouraged, but I just don't take any of the temptations. I refuse it. I could be as discouraged as anybody is. You know, I've got to have like five, I don't know, four or $5,000 an hour, 24 hours a day, 365 days out of the year just to break even. And I need more than that to prosper and do all that God told me to do. You know what? If I wanted to think about it, I could be depressed. I could be worried. I could stay up at night. But I just have chosen not to take this responsibility. The scripture says, casting all of your care over upon him because he cares for you. First Peter chapter 5. God told us to cast our care upon him. You can't pray and say, oh God, take the care from me. You have to cast it. You do that by refusing to think on things that aren't honest and lovely and just and poor, pure, and you just focus your attention upon God. You got to do something. Man, you got to fight a battle. The battle's right here between your ears. Everybody's wanting to get out here into spiritual warfare and go to binding this and loosening to that, and they want to have spiritual warfare conferences. The battle's not up in the heavenlies. The battle's right between your ears. And there's people that will go to great effort to pray and rebuke all of this stuff, and yet they don't go to any effort to renew their mind and to change the way you think. As you think in your heart, that's the way you're going to be. If you're depressed and discouraged, I can guarantee you, you're thinking on depressing and discouraging things. Zero exceptions. Somebody says, well, it's my hormones. It's not your hormones. <laughs> I'm trying to be nice, but there's just not a lot of nice ways to say this, brothers and sisters. God has provided everything for us. We're loaded. You are the victor. Yes. Satan is afraid of you. Yes. And yet most of us are living way, way, way below the standards because we just don't know what we've got. We embrace and accept defeat too easily. We see ourselves wrong. We don't see ourselves who we are in Christ. You spend too much time looking in the mirror, thinking about what you feel, and going by all of these physical, natural things instead of what the Word of God has to say about you. You know, I am living a life that is completely contrary to my natural talents and abilities. I am an introvert by nature. I couldn't even look at a person in the face and talk to them. I'm doing stuff that it's impossible for me to do. And you know, if I was to go back and just indulge my natural tendency, my character, traits and stuff. I could be, I could still be that way. And yet I'm just going against what I feel. I'm going by what God's word says. And I'm telling you, that's, that's how simple it is. What does God say you can do? Who does he say that you are? You find out and then you just do it. Whether you feel like it or not. Some of the greatest miracles I've ever seen have happened when I didn't feel a thing. I went and prayed for a woman in Chicago and this woman had only been watching me on television for a week and she had uh, stage four cancer. She was in a wheelchair. She's down to like 60 pounds. She was barely alive. She's one of the worst people I've ever seen in my life. And I tried to talk to her and she was so doped up. She had so much pain. They had her on such high medication that she would try and answer me and she would start talking and she'd fall asleep. And when her chin hit her chest, she'd jerk up and try and finish her statement. And I couldn't minister to her because she just wasn't all there. She wasn't even coherent. And the family that brought her, they had never heard me on television. They, she just made them bring her. None of them knew the Word of God. None of them knew what to believe. And I, I wanted to encourage them and pray for them, but you know what? It was just too little too late. And so I didn't know what to do. She couldn't even come down to the meeting. I had to go up to the hotel room and she was just totally out of it. And so 
you know what? I just said, well, in the name of Jesus, and I took my authority and rebuked the devil and commanded cancer to die, and then I walked out. And I started to tell the guy that I was with that, you know what? She'll die. It's just too little too late. She's not believing God. She doesn't know how to believe God. But I learned not to speak forth something contrary to what I prayed, so I just kept my mouth shut and didn't say anything. And three months later, this woman comes running down the aisle and jumps up on the platform. And she says, do you remember me? And I didn't remember because she had gained about 40 pounds or something like that. And she said, I'm the lady in Chicago that you prayed for. And I mean, God healed her. And it, you know, I didn't feel a thing. Matter of fact, if you would have asked me, I would have said too little, too late. She's probably gonna die. And yet you just do what the word of God says. You act on the word of God and God miraculously healed this woman in spite of me, not because of me. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, every one of you have the supernatural power of God on the inside of you. Every one of you have the ability to raise the dead, to cast out devils, to speak with new tongues, to lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. God has given this power to every single one of you, but it's not going to work until you believe that you've got it. You're going to have to quit going by what you feel. You're going to have to quit going by what your ex said about you and the things that they cursed you with. You're going to have to quit going by what you see in the mirror or feel in your emotions. And you're just going to have to take the word of God and go to believing what the word of God says and step out there and do some things. Amen. You know, real quickly, I'm going to try and do this real quickly, but the thing that really changed my life, I had this encounter with the Lord where I got born again when I was eight years old, but when I was 18, God showed up and I, I don't know how it happened, but I just experienced God in a tangible way for four and a half months. I was caught up into the presence of God and I mean, I was overwhelmed with the love of God. And it was a wonderful experience, but when that wore off, I didn't know what I did to make it happen. I didn't know what I did to make it leave. I didn't know how to get it back. And I panicked. And I spent months asking God to kill me and take me home because I figured that's the only way I could ever get back into this place to where I knew that God loved me. I could just feel his presence and tangible. I mean, it was like if I closed my eyes, I could reach out and touch him. And I didn't know how to get it back and it was desperate. And finally I got drafted and sent to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, I nearly got killed twice in one day. And I found out I really wasn't as excited about dying as I thought I was. <laughs> and so I decided that, you know what? I need to live. I don't need to be praying to die. And I didn't know I didn't know what to do. And out of desperation, I just started reading the Bible up to 10, 15 hours a day. I was in a bunker that was wallpapered with nude pictures of women. And I couldn't, you know, even put my Bible down and just look around and think. It was just like, I was like this. <laughs> 10, 12 hours a day or whatever. And I began to study the word and I began to get knowledge. God began to teach me things. And instead of going by just a feeling or an emotion, I began to read about who I was in Christ. And one of the verses that just transformed my life is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. It says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And when I read that, I thought, God, what does this mean? Because I looked in the mirror and I wasn't a new creature. I searched my mind and my emotions and I still had the same fears, the same thoughts, the same stuff. And I just could not understand what does this mean? Because I knew I was born again. I believed that I had confessed Jesus as my Lord, but I wasn't seeing any of this. And I thought, God, this says you become a new creature. Old things are passed away. It didn't say old things are passing away. It says old things have passed away. All things have become new. And I got to say, God, I just can't understand this. 
I don't see this newness in my body. I don't see it in my mind and in my emotions. And I was asking God, what does this mean? And the Lord led me to 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, and he's praying a prayer. And he says, I pray that your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the day of the Lord Jesus. And when I read that, I thought, there's a difference between spirit and soul. I had used those words interchangeably. And you'll find out that most people do. Matter of fact, the Strong's Concordance, if you look up the word pneuma, the word that's translated spirit in the Bible, it will define it as the immortal soul. It doesn't make a distinction between soul and spirit. And yet 1 Thessalonians 5.23 made a distinction between soul and spirit. And so I got to praying about this. And anyway, it's a long story, but the Lord finally showed me that when you get born again, it's not your physical body that changes. If you were a man before you got born again, you're still gonna be a man after you get born again. If you were a woman, you'll still be a woman. If you were short, you'll still be short. If you were fat, you'll still be fat. Your body doesn't change when you get saved. Now it's been purchased and we have a promise that we are gonna get a glorified body, but your body is not redeemed yet. It's been purchased, but it's not redeemed. The payment has not been cashed in and you still have a physical, natural body. And your soul isn't the part of you that's changed because if you get born again, you still have your thoughts. You don't have my thoughts. You have your memories. You remember your childhood. You remember your family. You remember where you live. You still got the same mind and you've still got the same emotions that were programmed based upon your experiences and the way you think. Your soul doesn't change. We often use the terminology about I'm a soul winner. And man, I came to see a soul saved. There's twice that I can think of in the Bible where it talks about like over in the book of Daniel, he that wins souls is wise. And over in the book of Hebrews, it talks about that we believe unto soul salvation. But soul salvation is not being born again. Your soul is your mind and your emotions. And when it talks about soul salvation, that's when you've been depressed and you believe God and all of a sudden you receive the joy of the Lord and you get your mind renewed, that's soul salvation. But being born again is where your spirit gets changed. That's the part of you. Just by process of elimination, you can tell it's not your soul, it's not your body that got saved, it's your spirit that got saved. And according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, old things passed away and all things became new. You are an absolutely brand new person in your spirit. One translation of 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, it's a new species of being that never existed before. That's who you are in your spirit. And this isn't something that's gonna happen in the future. It's something that's already a reality now. It says over in 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, it says, herein is love, uh, herein is our, how's that go? 1 John 4, 17, anybody got that? How's that go? Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment for as he is speaking about Jesus, so are we in this world. Not so are we going to be in the next world, so are we in this world. Now, is there anybody in here who's arrogant enough to believe that you in your physical body and in your soul are exactly like Jesus? Did you raise your hand? No, you aren't. You are not. Your body is not like Jesus. Jesus isn't overweight. He's not ugly. This body's gonna have to change. This body is not identical to Jesus right now. And your thoughts are not identical to Jesus. I can guarantee you, there are some of you thinking things about me right now that Jesus isn't thinking about me, amen. <laughs> Jesus loves me. And anyway, our thoughts aren't exactly like Jesus. So again, by process of elimination, you can tell it's not your body and it's not your soul, but it says, as Jesus is, so are we in this world. Do you think Jesus is depressed? Do you think Jesus is fearful? Do you think he's worried? 
Do you think he's lacking in any area? Do you think Jesus is sick? Do you think any of these things? No, Jesus is absolutely perfect. And the scripture says over in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Because in Christ, you are now a new creature. It says in Galatians chapter 4 that it was the spirit of his son that was sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. When you got born again, God put in your spirit, Jesus' spirit. You have the spirit of Christ in you. Romans chapter eight, verse nine says, now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If you say, well, I don't think I have the, the spirit of Christ, well, then you aren't his. If you were born again, you received the spirit of Christ, the spirit of his son into your heart, sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. You are brand new in your spirit. It's perfect. It's exactly like Jesus. It has his mind. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 16 says that we have the mind of Christ. We don't have a mind that has just been touched by Christ and is a little bit influenced. It's talking about in your spirit. You've got a mind. You've got a way of thinking in your spirit that is identical to Jesus. In your spirit, you are identical to Jesus. You have his power, his anointing. If people understood this, they wouldn't ask God for, oh God, give me more faith. You've got the faith of Christ. Paul said in Galatians chapter two, verse 20, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. He did not say by faith in the Son of God, he was living by the faith of the Son of God. God gave you his faith in your spirit. Galatians chapter five, verse 22 says, the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. Your spirit has faith and it is the faith of Christ. You've got the same quantity and quality of faith that Jesus had because it's his faith. He gave you his faith. And so for you to pray and say, oh God, just give me more faith. It means that you have a knowledge problem. You don't know what you got. And that's the reason that you aren't seeing your faith produce better results is because you've bought into the lie that, oh, faith works, but I just don't have much of it. God, give me more faith. You've already believed a lie. You don't know who you are. Again, I go back to that verse I used earlier, Philippians chapter, or Philemon chapter one, verse six, he says, I pray that the communication of your faith would become effectual, that means it would begin to work, by acknowledging every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Notice how your faith begins to work. It isn't by praying for more, asking God for more, praying, fasting, doing better, living holier or anything. It comes by acknowledging what you already have. The word acknowledge, that's not asking for something, that's just acknowledging what you already have. It has to do with knowledge. We've already got everything. God has already given you everything that you need. Did you know when you need wisdom, it says in James chapter one, verse five, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraids not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. He that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. You gotta believe that God has given you wisdom. And actually, if you look in Ephesians chapter one, I'm not gonna take time to turn over to these verses, but it says he's already abounded towards us in all wisdom and in all prudence. It says that you have the mind of Christ, 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. You have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. Most people, they go look at their last test score and they think, I don't know all things. This is proof. You couldn't find your glasses today and they were on top of your head. You couldn't find your car keys and people just say, well, I don't know all things. The Bible says you know all things. Which is it? both. In your spirit, you have the mind of Christ and you know all things. But with your little peanut sized brain, we don't know everything. 
This isn't talking about your natural mind, but in the spirit, you've got the mind of Christ. And man, I, I could spend an hour on this. I'm saying so much stuff here tonight. But in your spirit, you've got the mind of Christ. The Bible says, 1 Corinthians 14, 14, that when you pray in tongues, your spirit prays. What's it praying? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter two, the hidden wisdom of God. And then it says in 1 Corinthians 14, 13, that if any man prays in tongues, let him pray also that he may interpret. So you know what, when you need wisdom, all you gotta do is say, Father, thank you that I've already got the mind of Christ. I've got an unction from the Holy One and I know all things. That I, when I pray in the spirit, it's this part of me that knows all things that is praying. And so I'm going to pray forth the hidden wisdom of God and I am going to ask you for an interpretation. And it's just like you got this well here with all this life-giving water, but you could die of thirst if you can't draw it out. So you stick a bucket down in there and you draw it up. When you speak in tongues, it's your spirit praying this hidden wisdom of God. You're drawing this wisdom out. I mean, all you gotta do is, is ask for an interpretation and God will show you what to do. I know some of you think that's too simple. That's the way it works. I have had God show me thousands and thousands of things when I didn't know what to do with my natural mind, I just believed that in my spirit, I already had the answer and I would start speaking in tongues and then ask God for an interpretation and boom, like this, God would just show me what to do. I mean, things that once you see it, it's so obvious you wonder how you couldn't do it. But the carnal mind, it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, that the natural mind, talking about your carnal mind, is not subject to the law of God neither indeed can be. Or excuse me, that was from Romans chapter eight, but that was a great verse too. <laughs> the carnal mind is not subject to God, neither indeed can be. But over in 1 Corinthians 2, 14, it says, what does it say? Put that up there again. <laughs> Got sidetracked. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. You cannot relate to God with just your carnal understanding. You have to operate out of your spirit. Man, this is why it is so important that you be baptized in the Holy Spirit, that you speak in tongues. And there are people right in this room that have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and can speak in tongues, but you don't do it very often. And you'll be sitting there praying and saying, oh God, what do I do in the whole time? You've got this well of living water on the inside of you and you're dying of thirst because you didn't stick the bucket down in there. You didn't start praying in tongues and draw it out. Man, anytime you need wisdom, all you gotta do is start praying in tongues and then say, Father, uh, give me an interpretation. Show me what I'm doing. Some of you have heard me give this illustration, but when we moved into our Elton office, not the one, not the new one that we just built, but a previous one, I needed $3.2 million. And at that time, at the rate money was coming in, I sat down and figured it out. It would have taken me over $100 at the rate we were saving money to save $3.2 million. And so I went to get a loan. And for nine months, they told me that you have the loan, you're approved, we'll get your money next week. And that went on for nine months. And after nine months, they finally said, you know, it's been so long since we got the appraisal. We need a new appraisal. Let's just start all over. And man, our Bible college was just, it was being choked to death. We didn't have room, but for a hundred students in there. And we had to put porta potties outside and the men in the winter would go out in the snow and use the porta potties. We just, we couldn't accommodate any more people. I needed that money then. And so I told this guy, I said, no way am I gonna start this thing over and go another nine months. I said, you let me pray. And I started praying in tongues and I didn't walk hardly any further than from here to that wall over there. And I said, Father, I need an answer. I know in my spirit, I've got the knowledge, the mind of Christ. I'm asking for an interpretation. And before I got any further than that, the Lord reminded me of a prophecy. And it says that you don't need a bank because you have your own bank. Amen. 
And, and it went on to say that that's your partners. Your partners are going to do this and you'll be able to build, <clears throat> build everything debt free. And I had forgotten it. I got busy doing other things and I had forgotten this word. And when, when I had that thought come to me, I thought, could this be the reason that this loan isn't working out? It's because God doesn't want me to get a loan. And as I thought about it, I wasn't going to say that's what I was going to do and then change later on if it didn't work out. If I made a commitment to do this debt free, you know, the Bible says that a righteous man will, or a godly man will swear to his own hurt and change not. And if I said I was going to do it debt free, I was going to do it debt free. And like I had said, at the rate money was coming in, it would have taken me a hundred years without a miracle from God to save $3.2 million. It, I would have been gone. I'd have been dead. My vision for Karis Bible College would have never come to pass. And so it was a big deal. And man, I prayed about it to make sure, but the more I prayed about it, I just knew that that's what God spoke to me. I knew it was right. And so I told the guy that ran our ministry, I said, this is my decision. We're going to do this debt free. I will not borrow any money. And if they come to me and offer me all of the money that I've asked for tomorrow, I won't accept it. We're going to do this debt free. Guess what? The next day, they came and said, instead of 3.2, we're going to loan you $4 million. And I said, too late. And we turned it down. And in 14 months, we had that $3.2 million, and we moved into that building, and it worked. But that's how that happened, was believing these things. God says that you've got an unction. You know all things. You've got the mind of Christ. You don't need any man to teach you, but that anointing will teach you all things. In my natural, I thought, no, that's not true. I don't know. And I searched my carnal mind and I, the answer wasn't there. But then I believe what the word said, that when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying in the spirit and that I can pray that I interpret. And I just act on what the word says and this supernatural ability on the inside comes out. I can't tell you how many times I've done that. Thousands and thousands of times. And if you're born again and baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have this same thing. And yet how many people stumble through life not having an assurance that God has spoken to them that they're doing things. They're just hoping that it's working. You're leaning under your own understanding. That's like a blind person just going along. And it's just a matter of time until you are going to trip. You're going to fall. You're, something's going to happen to you. Man, you need to open up your eyes. We got all of these things. We got this wisdom from God, and yet most people, most Christians aren't using it. When I teach on the knowledge of God and the will, uh, the will of God, and that God has a plan for every person, usually I'll give an invitation at the end and ask those who aren't sure. They don't know for sure what God's told them to do. They're just kind of like a pinball. You got launched and you're just bouncing off things. This didn't work, so you do this, and you're just boing, boing, boing around. You don't have any, you don't have any control. Life has just pushed you in this direction. And after I teach on stuff like that, I'll ask how many of you don't know for sure. And it's not unusual out of, out of a group like this, spirit-filled Christians, to have 80, 90% of the people stand and say that they don't know for sure that they're doing what God called them to do. Brothers and sisters, I'm, I have compassion for you, but that is inexcusable. It is absolutely. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, don't be ignorant, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. God wants you to know his will. You can't accomplish God's will accidentally. You've got to have a goal. If you don't pursue it, you won't get it. You've got to know what God has called you to do. And you've got to move in that direction. And most people, well, how do I do that? By taking the things that I've been talking about, believing that God has already placed all this on the inside of you and you stick your nose in the Bible. You start learning how the kingdom works. You start unlocking these things. You pray in tongues and ask for an interpretation. And I tell you, you do this. God wants you to know his will more than you want to know it. He wants to reveal himself to you. God wants to use you. God wants to make your life so awesome that when you wake up in the morning, that you are just so excited about the day instead of pulling the covers over your head and wishing that you could go back to sleep. Man, you ought to be excited about the day. You ought to be excited about where your life is going. 
instead of saying, oh, Jesus, come back because I'm just about to give up. And you're, you're praying for the rapture so that you can escape. Man, you ought to be so excited that God, I'm, I'm looking for you to come back. Even so, come Lord Jesus. But man, I'm so excited about what God's doing that I could, I, if he tarries, awesome. Amen. Because I got a lot to do. I got a lot of things that he's shown me. You ought to be excited about your life. Brothers and sisters, God loves you. God has done everything for you. It's not God's fault that we aren't experiencing these things. He's put this on the inside of us. But the word of God is how you unlock it. It's how you draw this stuff out. And it's just our ignorance. People are perishing for our lack of knowledge. We've got to renew our mind. You've got to get in and find out who you are. My personal testimony is that when I begin to understand these things, I mean, I came alive. To think that I didn't have to just pray and then sit back and wait on God to do something, that he had already put this power on the inside of me. It's not me waiting on God. God's waiting on me. God's waiting on me to stir myself up to take the word and renew my mind and stand up and do something. Man, when I found these things out, it just made me come alive. I began to start believing for healing. I started seeing miracles happen. We started doing all kinds of things. And I'm telling you, the body of Christ has not been taught who they are in Christ and what he's done for them. Instead, we've been taught that God can do anything. He has done nothing, but he could do it. And if you would pray hard enough, and if you will live holy enough, and if you will do things just right, maybe God will move. And that's how the average person is seeking for God's power and demonstration in their life. But the truth is you've already got the fullness of the Godhead dwelling in you bodily. You can't get any more of God. You can't get any more faith. You can't get any more, knowledge, any more wisdom. You've already got these things. You just have to draw it out through the renewing of your mind. That's how you prove the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. It all comes down to the renewing of your mind. Amen? You know, we were at the Bible college today and we heard great testimonies. I didn't really minister. I just sat and listened to them give their testimonies. And it was awesome. It was awesome to hear them talk about the way that their life was changed. And the thing that changed every single person was just finding out the truth. Jesus said in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. The truth is what makes you free. John 17, 17 Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word of God is truth. It's the word. It's the truth of God's word that sets you free. And it's only the truth you know that sets you free. What you don't know isn't setting you free. You've got to renew your mind. And these students were just talking about how they've learned the word of God. Arthur was ministering in the school twi uh, two days already this week. And I heard a number of testimonies about guilt-free living and it just set people free. And they didn't get something new from God. It was just discerning or discovering what they already had, what Jesus had already provided. Man, I just wish somehow or another I could open up your brain and pour this stuff into you, but that's not how it happens. You can't do it by just laying hands on you. You know, I've got, I've got friends in ministry that they, they, are, uh, they come along and they lay hands on people. And this friend of mine, Dave Duell, some of you know him. I know Dan and Nancy Thompson are real uh, closely associated with him. But Dave and I used to go to uh, uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan twice a year and hold meetings in this church of about a thousand people. And we had what we called show and tell. And I would get up and tell about how to receive and stuff. And then after I preached, Dave would come up and start praying for people. And Dave operates in the supernatural and he blows on people, spits on people. He just does all kinds of weird stuff. And people would receive. And I mean, it was just miraculous. And I'd be sitting up here on the platform 
thinking of, and you know, I'd have people that had been partners with me for 10 years and didn't receive their healings and were still struggling. And David come along and blow on them and they'd get healed. <laughs> and I just sit there and think, what's going on here? But about half of the people Dave prayed for after they got up off the floor, they'd go away with the same problem. And so they, I'd have people come and talk to me and I'd sit there and tell them, I said, you know, you've already got it. God's already healed you. You take your authority, death and life are in the power of the tongue and I'd teach them. And anyway, the point I'm getting across is it's not one or the other. There were people that I had ministered to and they never got it through just the renewing of their mind. And so they needed somebody to come along who says, I've got the anointing on me. And they would put faith in his anointing and believe that when he prayed for them and they'd get it. But then there was others that the only way they would receive is to renew their mind and learn these things. And so God has used, and there have been these gifts that have special anointings and they come along and they, they build an atmosphere and say, the spirit of God is here. Anything is possible right now. For the next 15 minutes, God is here. And there's people that will receive that way. And I'm not against that. But you know what? You can't take that home with you. You can take the word of God home with you. I believe that the reason God uses gifts of the spirit in different ways to reach people is because if the only way you could receive from God was through the renewing of your mind and if you have a terminal illness and you've only got a week to live and yet it's gonna take a year for you to renew your mind, that would just mean that you have to die, that there's no hope for you. So God gave these special gifts to the body and praise God for it. Man, if you, you know, need a healing or something and you've done all you know to do, I, there's nothing wrong with you going and seeking out somebody that has a supernatural gift. But God never intended for the body of Christ to become dependent upon that and that to be the only way that they ever receive from God. God wants you to learn who you are and what you have so that you can just walk in healing and victory and joy and peace and prosperity on your own by the renewing of your mind. I believe that that's a stopgap measure to get you to a place to where you can receive directly from God. But sadly, the body of Christ only knows how to receive by praying, calling the prayer chain, getting a hundred people to pray and just call down the power of God and ask God to pour out his spirit. I tell you, a better way is like uh, Jesus told a number of people, he says, your faith made you whole. It wasn't his faith. They took the things that he was sharing with them about God and they believed and their faith made them whole. That's the person in Mark, Matthew chapter eight that he says, I've never found so great faith. A faith that just believed what the word of God had to say and they didn't go by what they felt like. He said, I don't need to see you come into my house. I don't need you to lay your hand upon my servant. You speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And Jesus marveled and said, this is the greatest faith I've ever seen. So praise God. I believe God will use all kinds of things to reach us, but I'm trying to say tonight that God has given you all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him. It's through the renewing of your mind that you experience the good, acceptable, and the perfect will of God. And brothers and sisters, we just have to start taking responsibility to renew our mind, to quit listening to the doubt and the unbelief of this world. Quit being plugged into the world. You know, there's a lot of people in this room right now that you watch the exact same stuff that unbelievers watch, you read the same stuff, you listen to the same music, you hear the same news, you get all of the same information, and yet you want different results than what others have. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. You are gonna have to unplug from the world. You are gonna have to quit thinking the thoughts that have produced all of the problems in you, and you're gonna have to get into the Word of God. And there's a lot of people that just aren't willing to go that far. Well, you better find somebody that's anointed and just move in with them. <laughs> Follow them around because you aren't gonna get it by the renewing of your mind. 
And you're gonna be dependent upon having somebody else come and pray for you. And I tell you, that's hit and miss. And you aren't gonna be able to walk in constant victory. But if you wanna live in an absolute victorious life, it all comes through the renewing of your mind, through the knowledge that God has given you. You need to take your authority and you need to start resisting the devil and he'll flee from you. And you do these things, and I guarantee you, brothers and sisters, you can walk in victory. It's really that simple. It's not easy what I've ministered tonight. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is get away from the knowledge of good and evil. That's what Satan tempted Eve with, feeling like she didn't know something. She was missing out on something. One of the hardest things you'll ever do is unplug from this world and not find out who won Dancing with the Stars <laughs> and who won the Super Bowl and all of this stuff. I mean, those are really big deals, big things. You know, I've just missed 46 years worth of American history and society. I don't even know. They were talking about somebody today that they were listening to somebody and I said, are they a singer? I'd never heard of them, and they, they, they were polite to me, but yeah, they're a singer, and I, I'm the only one in here who wouldn't know who they are. I've missed out on a lot of stuff. I've missed out on a lot of doubt and unbelief and fear and bitterness and hurt. I haven't been depressed in 46 years. I've seen my son raised from the dead, my wife raised from the dead. I've seen